So this will be a video documenting the entire process of me building my version of the Fender 5E3 Deluxe Guitar Amp. It'll be kind of a semi-instructional, semi just like watch, have fun watching me build this guitar amp kind of video. Um, it's pretty much the same circuit as the original Tweed Deluxe, but I did do a couple mods that I found on Rob Robinette's tube amp website, those mods being the switchable coupling caps and the switchable negative feedback. And I also linked his website and a couple other resources in the description that I found helpful, like um, Uncle Doug's YouTube channel. Um, I guess the only other thing is if you're going to do a build like this, definitely know what you're doing working with high voltage because it can be pretty dangerous. But other than that, I think we can get started. All right, so the first thing I did since I was building this chassis from scratch is I laid out all my dimensions on a piece of foam board. And I'm doing a custom chassis just because I kind of wanted to, to build the whole thing from scratch. And also designing a chassis uh, gave me more room to design dimensions around the coupling cab switch and the negative feedback switch. Um, I based my dimensions off the Mojo Tone chassis dimensions. I just rounded everything up to the nearest inch. And I based my layout, like where all the tube sockets and switches and everything go, I based that off of Rob Robinette's layout. And the only other mod that I did was I deleted the standby switch. But other than that, here is my finished layout. And it did change a little bit after this, but this is pretty much it. So I copied that onto a, um, a sheet of 16 gauge aluminum, and then just started cutting that out with the jigsaw. On the previous amp that I built, I used um, steel, and I would definitely recommend going with the aluminum because it was just so much easier to cut with the jigsaw. It was like pretty much impossible to cut the steel with the jigsaw, but this actually went pretty easily. And then I started drawing the pilot holes for the knobs and everything. I didn't show it, but I did use a hammer and a little punch to kind of dimple all the places that need to be drilled so that the drill doesn't like slide around all over the holes when you're trying to drill it in the right spot. And then for the uh, tube sockets, I just use these hole saw bits. And if you want to get a cleaner hole, you can use a chassis punch or a stepper bit, but those are kind of expensive and this did the job pretty well. So that's what I went with. And here is the aluminum sheet after some drilling. I didn't drill all the holes, like the ones for the um, knobs and switches and everything just because I didn't have those parts yet. I didn't want to drill the wrong size holes, but I had most of the hard ones out of the way so I could start bending. So my method for bending was pretty much just clamping it against a table and hammering it until it was flush, which seemed all right at first, but I ended up with these really messy bends. So I decided to scrap the whole thing and start over just because I wanted it to look good and I figured it was worth it to start over at this point. And what I did differently this time is I took an angle grinder and just slightly scored all of the um, all of the bend lines so that that's kind of a guide for the metal to bend against. And this worked a lot better. I was able to just bend it by hand, clamping it down, and I got these really good, clean, square bends. And then I took a break from bending to center tap or punch or whatever you call it, the spots where I need to drill. And I skipped some filming, but this is what the chassis looked like, all riveted together and pretty much done, except for drilling. Um, came out pretty nice. And then after a lot more drilling, which was a lot of the work for the entire amp is just drilling actually, I had a pretty nice chassis. So here's the finished chassis, or mostly finished I guess. I still had to drill the turret board holes and a couple holes for the output transformer wires. But there you can see the rivet holes for all the tubes, the output jacks, the negative feedback switch, and yeah, looks pretty good. So now that the chassis was done, I was able to start working on the turret board. And to do that, I just cut out some of this G10 fiberglass board, which is made for making turret boards, so I knew it was going to work pretty well. And then I went onto Rob Robinette's website and took a screenshot of his turret board layout and put it on pages and scaled it to my size and then printed it out and taped it to the turret board as a guide that I could use for drilling. 
Here's the board with all the holes drilled according to the template. And it was pretty satisfying taking the template off. All the holes lined up really well and it came out looking really clean. And now it's time to stake the turrets. And to do this, I use this little anvil that I made by drilling a hole into a bolt. And then what you do, using this method at least, is you can just stick the turret into the bolt so it won't bend against anything, it'll be supported well. And then I use this little punch thing in the drill press and you can just use the drill press to press the turret in. I should also mention that I got this idea with the bolt anvil thing from this website called guitarkitbuilder.com. So credit to them for coming up with that idea and also you should probably check that out for a bit more of a detailed explanation on how to do this. So once all my turrets were nicely staked, I think the board came out pretty well, looks pretty clean, uh, I decided to start soldering all the capacitors and resistors and everything to it, which is kind of a fun step because it's cool to see the whole board come together, and it's not super difficult, at least compared to like bending and drilling a metal box. And here is the mostly finished turret board. It wasn't completely finished just because I hadn't put the ground buses on, but other than that it was done. And then I also finished the remaining holes in the chassis that I kind of had forgotten about, like the chassis mounting holes, the wire holes for the output transformer, and the power cord hole. And I also got some rubber grommets to put in those holes. And the next step was to pretty much just mount everything that needed to be mounted to the chassis to the chassis and this is probably my favorite part of building the whole amp just because it goes from looking like a metal box to looking like a finished amp in about 30 minutes or at least it looks like a finished amp on the outside not on the inside because there's no wiring done yet but yeah this is a pretty cool step of building the amp After struggling for a little bit to find bolts that would fit the mounting holes for the output transformer, here is the finished chassis, with the exception of the coupling cap switch that I forgot to drill a hole for and forgot to put in, but I remembered that just in time, eventually. Then I started to wire stuff, starting with pretty much just everything coming out of the power transformer. These are the filament wires running along the upper edge of the chassis, twisted together to prevent hum. You can see the output jacks there, which are not, or actually they have been wired in that frame. Here's the pilot light, with the filament wires, power switch, fuse, and that blue wire is this 50 volt bias wire, I think, that I didn't need for this amp, so I just heat shrinked it off and tucked it away in the corner. I didn't end up recording a lot of video wiring stuff inside the chassis, just because it's kind of a pain to do that, but here are the input jacks with those 1 meg input resistors the volume pots and tone pot with the bright cap and tone cap and then also the output jacks with the negative feedback switch and here are the output tube sockets with the 1.5k grid stopper resistors soldered on and I also had to do an artificial center tap for the filament wires with the 100 ohm resistors because the power transformer that I'm using did not come with a center tap for the filament wires and now the time had come to mount the turret board, which was kind of difficult just because those bolts are kind of hard to reach with pliers and a screwdriver. And also you've got to deal with all those leads coming off of it that I soldered on off camera. But I eventually got it in there with a little bit of difficulty, not too bad. And then once it was in, it was really looking like it was coming together. It was pretty close to being done. And this time lapse, my phone ended up dying before the end of this time lapse, which is kind of unfortunate but I got all those wires wired to the tube sockets and everything, which wasn't a super difficult part. You have to be careful with lead dress, like how often your wires are crossing and everything to make sure the amp isn't too noisy, but it went pretty smoothly.
here is the tube side of the chassis all wired up, starting with the output tubes right there, then moving on to the output jacks, which you already saw with the, that negative feedback switch and the negative feedback resistor, then the two preamp tubes. And you can also see I finally put that coupling cap switch in there. And after wiring up the input jacks and the volume pots and the tone pot, it was done. Everything was where it needed to be with wires and everything. And I think it came out looking pretty good. No real flaws with it that I can tell so far. Everything looks pretty clean and I'm pretty happy with how it came out. At this point I was ready to plug in a speaker and a guitar and test it, but it's generally a good idea to not just plug it in and hope it doesn't blow up, even though it probably won't actually blow up unless you did something seriously wrong. But what I did is I went back to Rob Robinette's website and followed his amp startup procedure, which pretty much has you first just plug in, power up the amp with the rectifier tube, and then the preamp tubes, and then the power tubes and the speaker. And at every step, you check voltages to make sure everything is going the way it should. Um, it's also good, a good idea to use a variac, which I didn't have when you're first powering it up to form the filter caps. And it is also a good idea to use a light bulb current limiter, which is pretty easy to build. It pretty much just has the current that's going to the amp pass through a light bulb. So instead of blowing fuses, if you have a short or something, the light bulb will just light up really brightly, telling you that there's a short somewhere in the amp and something isn't right. Here's a picture of my light bulb current limiter in use. Mine's kind of sketchy to be honest. There are a couple of exposed connections. You should probably build one a little safer than this. But as you can see, the filament is just barely glowing, which is how it should look if the amp is working properly. If the bulb were to glow near or at its rated brightness, there's probably an issue somewhere in the amp. You also have to use a fairly high wattage bulb for this to work, because if you use a super low wattage bulb, the bulb is just going to glow really bright no matter what. Here is my testing setup. I have the ground probe on the multimeter clipped to the chassis with a little wire clip, and I did clip off that excess wire on that clamp. And here it is plugged into my current limiter, which I showed before. Here I am about halfway through the testing process. I've got the rectifier in and the preamp tubes. Voltage is looking good, and there's the light bulb limiter looking the way it should. And with everything looking good, I was finally able to test it. I ended up using this crappy like hi-fi speaker because I realized that was all I had that was eight ohms. So I was only able to really see if it actually worked, not really test the sound. It actually did sound pretty decent through this hi-fi speaker, I just wasn't able to push it at all, because if you get into any overdrive or anything, it just is way too much for that little speaker. And then once I knew it worked, I decided to take it to my local guitar shop, Doobie's Music, to play it through a cab that they had so I could actually get a feel for how it sounded. And this is the owner, Tom Doobie, playing through it. So now that I knew that it sounded pretty good, there weren't really any issues with the like amp itself. I did have to, I did measure, do a voltage chart and measure the bias of the output tubes, everything looked good. So I made this SketchUp design for the cabinet, which is pretty much the same as the regular, like original Tweed Deluxe cabinet. But since my chassis is slightly bigger than a normal one, I made the cabinet slightly bigger. But other than that, it's pretty much the same design as the original Tweed Deluxe cabinet. I decided to do finger joints for the cabinet, so I cut out some pieces of 3 quarter inch um, pine and I made this router jig to cut the finger joints which basically turns like a hand router into a router table. I saw that on YouTube, I'll link the video because it's pretty cool, but it worked really well. 
and then here are my boards with the pretty perfect finger joints. The boards were a little warped, so they didn't like glue together perfectly, but after sanding and everything, it all came out pretty well. Then I started on the speaker baffle. I used a piece of half inch plywood and then just traced the speaker onto it and cut it out with the jigsaw. You can use a router jig or like, like a router table to make a perfect circle, but honestly the jigsaw does the job fine, especially if you just sand it a little bit after. After that I put these quarter 20 captive nuts in, which uh, hold the speaker on. And then I also glued on these little spacers to elevate the grill cloth above those things. And here is the speaker baffle mostly done. The only thing I had to do after that was spray paint it black, which prevents the shiny nuts and bolts, and even wood, I guess, from showing up through the grill cloth. For grill cloth, I just used this kind of stretchy, thin, maroon, um, fabric that I found at Joanne Fabrics, which is just like this chain fabric store. And then I just wrapped it around the back and stapled it on, and I put a little super glue around every staple to prevent it from tearing around the staples since it's pretty thin. But it ended up working pretty well as a grill cloth. And the speaker baffle needs something to screw into, so I used these leftovers from my pine board that I used for the cabinet as cleats, and then I also used some plywood as well for the vertical ones. Now it was time to do the cutout for the chassis, and I just measured out where those lines need to be and cut it out with the jigsaw. And then I sanded the whole cabinet. I wanted to have rounded edges, just because I think that looks kind of nice, but I didn't have a router table, so I just used the electric sander and it ended up working pretty well, even for the like really rounded edges on the finger joints. A router table would definitely give you a probably more pristine, perfect finish on the edges, but I think the electric sander does a pretty good job. And then I covered the whole thing in polyurethane. I didn't really want to go through the trouble of covering the cabinet in tweed or some other material, and I kind of liked how the finger jointed pine looked anyway. So I just put some polyurethane on. I did two coats and I set up this little thing in my basement hanging the cabinet from the ceiling so I could do it all at once. And then I put these little white rubber furniture feet on. Um, I had to put a washer under one of them just to make up for the board being slightly warped but after I did that the amp stood pretty flat. And then it was finally time to put the speaker baffle on. I put the speaker on the back of the baffle using those bolts and captive nuts, and then I drilled some pilot holes and screwed the baffle in using some wood screws and finishing washers. To attach the chassis to the cabinet, I flipped the cabinet over so I wouldn't have to try and hold the cabinet up, or hold the chassis up, trying to bolt it to the cabinet. So with it flipped upside down, it was a lot easier, and I rested it on a couple pieces of scrap wood to prevent the power switch from hitting the table. And to attach it to the cabinet, I just used some bolts and washers and lock washers to keep them from loosening themselves up with vibration and stuff like that. So here's the cabinet pretty much done, but you might be wondering why there is no handle and no back panel at this point. And that's pretty much just because the handle hadn't come yet, and I hadn't gotten the correct wood for the back panel yet, and I really wanted to see how this cabinet sounded. So I just pretty much put the cabinet together with the chassis in it like this so I could play through it while I was waiting for the handle, and while I didn't have my uh, birch plywood that I was using for the back panel. So once my handle came in the mail, I took the cabinet, or I took the chassis back out of the cabinet, and drilled some holes and put in the captive nuts that came with the handle. And the handle I'm using is the Fender brand Tweed Deluxe like replica handle, which I think looks pretty good with this cabinet. And I also put some weather stripping in to prevent the chassis from rattling. And then I just attached the handle to the cabinet with the brackets and bolts that the handle came with. <laughs> 
Now it was time for the back panel. And to do that, I started with the cleats, which were more leftovers from the boards from like the rest of the cabinet. So I just glued those in after cutting them to size and clamped them on. And then for the back panel itself, I used some quarter inch Baltic birch plywood and traced on the shape that I was doing. I didn't end up going with the original shape, but I went with my own little design. And I had access to a scroll saw and a spindle sander at the time, so I did all the cutting and sanding with that, which ended up making things a lot easier. And then after drilling some holes and putting in some captive nuts, I was able to do a test fit. And you can see that my design gives you full access to the tubes, but it does leave them a little more vulnerable. But this thing is going to be living in the safety of my living room, so it's not really a big deal. And then for the bottom panel, or I don't know if it's really a panel, it's just kind of something to hold the power cord in and to make it look good. But I guess just used another piece of this quarter inch Baltic birch. Um, three inches wide and I had to chisel out a little bit of the wood because for some reason I think when I cut it it wasn't um, completely like flat or whatever but it ended up working out pretty well with the crude chisel job and then it was just a matter of screwing everything in. You can also see there's a piece of Gorilla Tape on the right there for the same reason as the chiseling. Um, I think just when I cut those pieces out with a table saw the table saw must have just been a tiny bit off vertical so that's why that was an issue but it was pretty easily fixable and now the amp was done i did end up adding some foam weather stripping between the back panel and the chassis because of some rattling and vibrations i was getting but here is the finely finished amp i'm really happy with how it came out it's definitely not perfect just because this was my first time really going all in with one of these amps but Aside from some slightly off finger joints and things like that, I think the uh, the whole amp came out really good. I'm happy with it. And I think it was worth all the time, effort, and money. And now it's time for a demo. I'm not going to try to demonstrate every single sound you can get out of this amp just because there are a million different combinations of interactive volume controls and channel jumpering and everything. I'm just going to play the settings that I find myself usually playing, which usually involves the bright high channel and the tone knob around halfway. For this demo, I'll be using my Epiphone Les Paul, which has the coil splitting feature for the changes humbuckers to single coils. And I will also, of course, be using my limited edition Chibson USA hand pick. So I think that does it for my take on the Fender 5E3 Tweed Deluxe. I don't really know why my iPhone camera started freaking out when it got loud, and the microphone definitely didn't do it justice, but I think you get the idea. I hope you found it helpful if you're building something like this yourself, and I hope you found it entertaining even if you're not. So yeah, thanks for watching.